Welcome to TBI headquarters in Nashville. This building opened in the year 2000 and houses the largest of our state's three crime laboratories. Over the next few minutes, we'll show you around, tell you about our forensic disciplines, and introduce you to some of our incredible team members who play a vital role in protecting and serving the citizens of Tennessee. Our Nashville Crime Laboratory occupies roughly half of our facility, and it all starts here with evidence receiving. The first and last stop for the thousands of pieces of evidence our scientists work with every year. The Evidence Receiving Unit receives, inventories, distributes, and stores all evidence submitted to the laboratory from law enforcement agencies across the state. In order to accomplish this efficiently, there are evidence receiving units in each of TBI's three crime laboratories. The chain of custody internally begins and ends here, and it's very important we maintain this chain of custody. That way the evidence, the integrity of all the evidence can be maintained. We know where all evidence is at any given time. Forensic technicians must be meticulous in documenting certain things about each item of evidence, including the date and time of submission, submitting officer and agency, and how each item is packaged. They must also pay close attention to ensure each item submitted has the proper labeling and seal. Forensic technicians are responsible for creating a unique laboratory number for each new case and exhibit numbers for each item in the case. Once these individual numbers are generated, they will label each item with the proper lab number and exhibit number, along with a computer-generated barcode and their individual ID. This information is paramount for maintaining a proper chain of custody for the evidence while in TBI hands, as well as returning evidence to the submitting agency. We'll continue our tour on the second floor by heading down this hallway, where on the left you'll find our microanalysis unit. Microanalysis, also known as trace evidence, examines and compares a variety of evidence that can be transferred during the commission of a crime. Trace evidence helps put together pieces of the investigative puzzle, linking people or objects to places. This can include a wide range of materials, such as fibers, paint, glass, impression evidence, gunshot residue, fracture matches and physical comparisons, fire debris, as well as chemical unknowns. A particular person in micro that's really good at putting puzzles together and likes piecing things together, um, they may be trained in fracture matching or physical comparisons. Other uh, folks in the unit are more adept to um, instrumental testing, so they would do things like gunshot residue or fire debris testing, which is where we're looking at instrumentation or uh, data from an instrument that's coming from a piece of evidence. At a crime scene, there are often tiny fragments of physical evidence such as paint and fibers from clothing or carpeting, or pieces of glass that can indicate a person or thing was present. For example, an individual burglarizes a home, stepping on a broken piece of glass. Not only can shoe impressions be collected from the scene, but also glass fragments can be recovered from the shoes, linking the subject to the crime scene. Careful collection of materials from a crime scene can yield a wealth of information about where a sample came from and how it helps tell the story. Scientists examine the physical, optical, and chemical properties of trace evidence and use a variety of tools and instruments and compare samples. Every item that can be touched or transported has the potential to become trace evidence. Next up, a bit further down the hallway, latent fingerprints. Training for a TBI latent print examiner takes at least a year and maybe up to two years. During that time, a scientist learns about the history of latent prints, how friction ridge skin develops, how prints are left behind, as well as how to compare prints developed to known impressions. I think the biggest value of using latent prints to solve crime is the uniqueness and persistence of latent prints. They're unique to each individual as no two prints have ever been found to be the same, and they're persistent throughout somebody's life. Examining items of evidence for the presence of latent fingerprints is one of the most common forensic examinations. When you touch an object with your friction ridge skin, you leave a reproduction of those ridges, known as a latent print. Latent in Latin means hidden, so these prints are not usually visible to the naked eye and require some type of processing to make them visible. 
Scientists in this unit process two main types of evidence, porous and non-porous. Porous items are those in which the print soaks into the object, such as paper, cardboard, or unfinished wood. Non-porous would be items in which the print remains on the surface of the object, such as glass, metal, and plastic. There are different tests for porous and non-porous items. Additionally, scientists can develop latent prints on the sticky side of tape, as well as prints in blood. Once a scientist develops a latent print, it can be compared to known individuals associated with the case or searched through a national database known as APHIS. Our lab administration team has office space on the second floor as well. Next, we'll head upstairs. Our first stop on the third floor is Forensic Biology and CODIS. The Forensic Biology Unit at TBI performs serology and DNA testing on evidence that is submitted to the lab in relation to a crime, including sexual assaults, homicides, aggravated assaults, robberies, and burglaries. Serology involves testing for the possible presence of bodily fluids, including blood, semen, or saliva. Evidence can also be swabbed for touch DNA in order to determine who may have handled an item by the skin cells left behind. Once samples have been collected from the evidence, they are taken onto the DNA analysis process, which consists of a series of steps ultimately ending with the generation of a DNA profile. The DNA profile from the evidence sample can then be compared to profiles from known individuals to determine a match. A DNA profile does not give any information regarding the race or physical characteristics of the individual other than gender. Samples from evidence can be entered into the CODIS database to be cross-referenced against other crime scene samples, along with offender and arrestee profiles. If you have a match between a piece of evidence and a known person, the statistics that are provided to give weight to that match are going to be in the numbers of 1 and 1 in sextillion, which is a 1 with 21 zeros after it. And just to give you an idea, the world population is around 8 billion, so much larger than any people have, that have ever lived on the Earth. In addition to the standard educational requirements TBI has for forensic scientists, the FBI mandates additional coursework in genetics, biochemistry, molecular biology, and statistics for DNA analysts. The training process for an analyst in forensic biology typically lasts between 12 and 18 months and consists of observing qualified analysts, presentations on various topics, working mock evidence samples, and working evidence samples under the close supervision of a qualified analyst. The final step in this lengthy process is a mock case followed by a mock trial. CODIS is the Combined DNA Index System and is a software that holds a database of DNA profiles that can be searched against DNA profiles from every U.S. state and federal agency. The CODIS unit at TBI handles and houses all samples that are CODIS eligible in the state of Tennessee. Eligible samples include a specific list of felony offenses for arrestees and offenders, plus samples from criminal investigations developed by the Forensic Biology Unit. And that database is not only linked through the state, but also throughout the nation, and if need be, even internationally. And for that reason, when unknown profiles from forensic biology cases are entered into the system, they might be hit, what we call a match, to a CODIS sample. And that's what solves the crime. We're then able to give a name and a date of birth and that personal information that belongs to that person's database number. And that's what solves crimes. Upon arrest or conviction of certain crimes, the CODIS unit receives samples from law enforcement agencies across the state, totaling almost 30,000 samples a year. When the unit receives these samples, the unit assigns each a unique identifying database number, and a scientist obtains a DNA profile for each sample. Scientists then enter these profiles into the CODIS database after careful review. Forensic casework profiles entered from the Forensic Biology Unit are searched against these arrestee and offender DNA profiles and can potentially match to a sample received through the CODIS unit. CODIS has been used to identify human remains, 
find missing persons and solve active and cold cases in Tennessee since 2002. Just down and across the hallway is our next stop, our Firearms and Toolmark Identification Unit. The training period for scientists in the Firearms and Toolmark Identification Unit lasts two years, making it the longest in the entire forensic division. Scientists must be well-versed in the many different types of firearms and ammunition. The unit's primary function is to determine if a bullet, cartridge case, or other ammunition components were fired from a particular firearm. Scientists do this by using a comparison microscope, which allows one to examine two pieces of evidence simultaneously. So what I'm looking for are two sets of characteristics class an individual. These are marks that are going to be reproducing from the firearm, which is the source of these marks. If I find that these marks are reproducing, then I can identify a piece known as evidence, say from the scene or from an ME's office, back to a particular gun. So here I've got two bullets up. I've got one test fire, a known source production from the gun, and I'm comparing it to evidence from the scene. So here I'm looking for these very fine striated marks that are reproducing from the gun, and I found them on the bullet from the crime scene. Additionally, scientists in this unit determine caliber with a single bullet and generate a list of firearms that could have fired that particular bullet, provide a range of distances at which the muzzle of a firearm was in relation to a particular target when it was fired, restore obliterated serial numbers, and determine the trajectory of shots into a vehicle and recover the evidence from inside. Images of cartridge cases from crime scenes or from test firing a firearm can be entered into NIBIN, the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network database. These images are compared with images of cartridge cases that have previously been entered to determine if a gun has been used in multiple shootings. Further down and across the hall through these windows is our next stop, Forensic Chemistry. The purpose of the TBI's Forensic Chemistry Unit is to identify legally significant compounds. These may include, but are not limited to, controlled substances as defined by the Tennessee Code Annotated, substances that have the potential to be abused, and precursors to those compounds. Scientists in TBI's Forensic Chemistry Unit use a variety of techniques and instrumentation, which includes gas chromatograph mass spectrometers, known as GCMS, gas chromatograph infrared spectrometers, known as GCIRs, microscopes, electronic balances, and chemical color tests to analyze any substance seized in violation of laws regulating the sale, manufacture, distribution, and use of abusive type drugs. So we do two separate samplings on the sample itself just to, it's kind of a, in my opinion, like a check. If you get the same answer in both cases, then that further validates your result. It's kind of up to the analyst's discretion, but as long as you have one good test that will tell you the structural information about the compound, then you can use that. Unlike the toxicology unit, the forensic chemistry unit deals with solids and liquids outside of the body. Scientists in this unit maintain close working relationships with TBI's Drug Investigation Division to analyze clandestine cases as well as provide knowledge on current drug trends. Time now to round the corner for our final stop on the third floor, toxicology. The TBI toxicology unit assists with driving under the influence, motor vehicle accident, and medical examiner cases by looking for the presence of alcohol or drugs in the human body. Specifically, scientists work to determine any drugs that could potentially impair an individual's ability to operate a motor vehicle. Toxicology is always changing. If you think about all the new drugs that are coming out every day, toxicology in, in this unit, we have to be able to adapt and make changes quickly. Uh, you know, a new drug may hit the market, and if, if it has a potential for abuse, you know, people are going to abuse that drug, and so we have to be able to identify that drug 
to try to, you know, convict the people that are abusing it. In most cases, scientists do this by analyzing samples of blood submitted to the crime laboratory. First, scientists test samples for the presence of ethanol, the type of alcohol found in alcoholic beverages. From there, analysts screen samples to determine what drug classes or families are present. Additional tests will then identify what and how much of a specific drug from that class is present in the sample. Now it's time to head back downstairs to the second floor, where you'll find our breath alcohol unit. The scientists in the breath alcohol section at TBI are a little different than the rest of the laboratory in that they do not work with case evidence. Instead, they calibrate scientific instruments and certify operators to use those instruments in the field. The evidence submitted to those instruments is then presented in court for DUI cases. There are two different models of instrumentation used in the state of Tennessee for breath alcohol cases. One is a desktop instrument, the Intoximeter ECIR2. The other is a portable, handheld instrument, the Intoximeter ASVXL. Each of these instruments requires separate certification courses instructed by members of TBI's breath alcohol section. The way that we that alcohol works in the human body is it comes out in your breath at a, at a ratio of what's in your bloodstream. And so we can get a sample from someone's breath and it can be very consistent with what's in their blood. That's something that is a lot faster than getting a blood draw and submitting the case the kit and it coming here and then and then going through the steps in toxicology. It's a good easy way to test a sample without a lot of, um, for our operators they don't have to be scientists. We do all the science with the calibration. Instrument calibration is performed on all evidentiary instruments in the state of Tennessee by TBI breath alcohol scientists. These calibration activities occur every 90 days or less. Scientists may do this process at where the instrument is located or at one of our three crime laboratories. This process involves using certified reference materials of known values being run through the instrument to ensure it is still reading different alcohol levels at an appropriate range. Operator certification is performed in person to individuals at police agencies, jails, etc. Students are instructed on how the instrument works, how breath alcohol testing is possible, how to perform a test, and troubleshooting to alleviate any potential errors during the testing procedure. Scientists in this department are also called upon to testify in court to the reliability of a specific instrument where a subject was tested. These scientists often testify to calibration activities, maintenance on a specific instrument, operator training, and any other questions regarding breath alcohol. TBI also has crime laboratories in East and West Tennessee, and our scientists don't just stay in the laboratory. They also rotate on an on-call violent crime response team to gather evidence in the field on major crime or law enforcement use of force scenes. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us on social media. Find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at at TB Investigation, or visit us online at tn.gov slash TBI.